Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. All right, good morning. We're ready to go. If you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47 is our text for today. I entitled this sermon, Timeless Church. Timeless Church. And we have seen in Acts chapter 2 so far the power, the preaching, and today we're going to see even more about the people of the church. The power being the Holy Spirit, the preaching being the, the ministry of the gospel, and then also the the people of the church. And so we're going to focus in on the people of the church quite a bit in our text today. And what did the church do at that time? And you could essentially really organize the church life of Acts 2 and today in three subjects. Number one, we can organize the church that one of the things we do is worship God. The worship of God. So our daily devotion to him, our obedience, our prayer, our communion, our praise. The church is here on earth to worship God. Two, we see in scripture and in our scripture today, the spiritual growth of the church or the edification, the building up of the saints and the body of Christ. So the love for one another, the discipleship, teaching, serving, and generosity. You'll see the church in the, in the Bible and the church today growing spiritually. And then God adds to the fellowship those who are being saved. So also numerically the church grows. But you'll see in scripture many times lessons about us as the church growing together in the Lord. How many know we need to mature in our relationship with God after salvation? Amen. Right? So for those of you who gave your life to Christ today before communion, we'd love to know so you can tell us at the Connect Center or fill out a card in the pew because we want to help you grow in your faith and grow in your relationship with the Lord. And lastly, the church is busy evangelizing the world. This is where we shine and be a light and we have faith for miraculous signs and wonders to help people believe and we bear witness to the gospel. So we're supposed to be witnesses who tell the world about the good news of Jesus using the word of God and our testimony. So you follow me there? I'm a little nerdy about this stuff, okay, because as a pastor, I care about the church and our church and what we should be doing. And listen, we're living in a world where churches are getting off bad, like they have lost their way, and Calvary's going to stick to the word of God, okay? All right, we're going to do what we need to do, and, and, and we're going to continue to teach what we're supposed to teach, but here's the thing, so... Uh, there's certain things that should not change, and that's the point of my sermon today, all right? The, the message of the gospel should not change. The mission to reach the lost and to make disciples should not change. Methods can change, but the message should never change. We got to be careful, and we're seeing churches do that to uh, appease people who disagree with us. We, you know, and I, look, there's going to be disagreement. That is life, okay? We can't all agree together all the time. There is going to be disagreement. The, the world doesn't have fellowship with the church, should I say. We don't see eye to eye, I should say, on things. So we need to know that there's going to be disagreement. And uh, at Calvary, we want to be in agreement with God before we're in agreement with everything else. All right, we want to be in line with God before we're in align with the world. Our scripture today is interesting. It's a thesis paragraph that actually gives a preview of what Luke is going to talk about in the next few chapters. So he's basically given us a preview, a little trailer, so to say, of what's about to be taught in Acts 2, 42 through Acts 6, verse 7. And what he does is he gives little vignettes, so to say, little stories that help illustrate Acts 2.42. So keep that in mind. As we go through the next few chapters, he already talked about them, a broad view of it in our scripture today. 
But then he begins to illustrate what he meant in the next few chapters. It's really interesting how he laid it out. So let's get into it. Acts, Acts 2, 42. All the believers, say all, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. Say all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And I'll spare you from doing it again. But and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Sounds pretty good, right? They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day met in homes for the Lord's Supper, which we did today in the church, the communion, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. If you were to read this multiple times, you'll see this theme of all, all in. Everyone was all in, and they were all devoted to this church. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the Lord's Supper, and and being together, eating meals. They were devoted to prayer and worship. They were devoted to the mission of making disciples. This is what we actually see in the scripture. And we see right away that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. The apostles lived with Jesus for about three and a half years. So do you think they had a lot of knowledge to, to share? Yeah, they had a lot of knowledge to share from their experience with Jesus, and the people didn't leave Jerusalem after they got saved. They stayed, and there was this hunger for the word of God. There was a hunger for more instruction. So they stayed, and they devoted themselves to hearing and learning from the apostles. They probably preach much longer than I do, just so you know. There's some stories later on in Acts where they, someone falls asleep during a sermon. All right, we'll read that later on, okay? But they were devoted to the apostles' teaching because they heard the word of Jesus through already in the book of Acts in the beginning. They wanted more of Jesus. They wanted more. And the apostles were commanded to teach them everything, to obey everything that Jesus has commanded them. So they were told in the Great Commission to teach people everything I have commanded you. So it was the apostles' duty to make sure, or pastors and teachers, to make sure the church knew the truth and the holy word, okay? So they were devoted to that. They were also devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to one another. They were all devoted to one another. That is so key. The word here, fellowship, is the word koinonia, okay? It's a Greek word for, and it's really hard to kind of Put your finger on exactly what it is, but it's a spiritual, intimate, personal relationship. It's it's fellowship spiritually, but it has to be also felt physically. You follow me on that? So basically we have fellowship through Christ spiritually because we all are believers in Jesus. And his spirit comes in us and now we have spiritual fellowship with each other. But then they had fellowship, whereas they felt the fellowship. They were there for one another, eating together, uh, taking the Lord's Supper together, praying together. So there was this togetherness as well. 1 John 1, 3 through 4 says this, We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. So they preached the gospel so that people would believe and have fellowship with them. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Have you ever been around someone and you're like, I think they're a Christian? Do you know what I'm talking about? You can tell. There's like a like-mindedness, and you care about the same things, or you can tell that they have a light in them, and you're like, I think that person's a Christian. That happens to me all the time. Like, I'll bump into someone in the public, and they have this peace about them. And I'll be like, I'm kind of curious. Are you a believer? And they're like, yes, I am. Jesus is my Lord and Savior, you know. Did, during worship, did you feel a like-mindedness that we were worshiping in spirit and in truth together? 
Or when we take communion together, we are one body, no matter where we come from, our background, doesn't matter the color of our skin or our age, we are one body. It's the koinonia, the spiritual fellowship of Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter where you come from, when you believe in Jesus Christ, you belong to the family of God. And we're supposed to make sure we feel that love and that family aspect as well. People that don't have Christ, don't have the Holy Spirit, they won't feel the same when they come in here. And that's okay. We pray that the Lord would change them and that they would also feel what we feel. That's what I want. I want for unbelievers to come in here and be like, whoa, this is awesome. The way everyone's loving each other, praying for one another, encouraging each other. I want what they have. And what we have is Jesus Christ living in us. And that's what we want them to have as well. So they were devoted to that. They were devoted to spiritual fellowship. I'll get into that more later. They were devoted to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper. Now, there's argument over what's actually said here in the Greek. Is it communion in the Lord's Supper or is it eating together meals? Like, you know, having Texas Roadhouse together, okay? They didn't have Texas Roadhouse back then, no. So... I think we split hairs on this too much in our scholarly work of the Bible. They shared meals together, they ate together, and when they got together, they also would take the Lord's Supper together. And in fact, we know this to be the case because 1 Corinthians 11, Paul has to correct the church uh, because the way they were doing communion and eating together, they were abusing some of that. You can read more about that if you want to. It's on our notes online at calvarydover.org. There's an article about that explaining what happened. So they were eating together and they were taking communion together. To break the bread, to take communion together, is to be the body of Christ broken for us, giving himself to suffer and die. I talked about this during our communion. Communion was done as a remembrance that we have a relationship with Christ, we need him every day, and that we are one body. Do you know they used to take one loaf and break it to represent the body of Christ being broken, but they would also take pieces of bread off that one loaf to say we all came from the same loaf. We all came from the same body. We all belong to the same body, which is Jesus Christ. So there was this unity even when they took communion together. They were devoted to eating together and communion, and they were devoted to prayer. Before Pentecost, they prayed all the time. While the Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost, they were praying, and they continued to pray constantly. We're going to see that as we go through the book of them gathering together to pray. They prayed in the temple, at church, or they prayed in their homes. And prayer was done together more than it is today, just so you know. I think we need to improve in this area as the American church. I think we need to say, we're going to pray, but we're also going to pray with people so they can hear our prayers for them. And that people can learn how to pray because you prayed with them. I think there's, a, there's power in prayer together. Would you, would you agree? Remember, if there's a spiritual fellowship, koinonia, certainly we're going to feel that where two or more are gathered, he is there in our midst, as the scripture says. So we need to grow in praying for one another and in person. And thank God for technology or for phone lines. We can make phone calls and pray for people, can't we? So even distance isn't an issue anymore. Verse 43, just to review, I'm going to go back to that verse because we're moving on. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. So we see they were devoted to all those things beforehand. Now he's going to get a little more specific. There was a deep sense of awe that came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. As the apostles did life, as they were going about to worship, next chapter we're going to see next week, as they were on their way to worship, they did signs and wonders. They healed. Okay? And there was this great sense of awe that came over the entire fellowship. Why? Because they could see that the presence of God was in their midst. The might of God, the power of God was among them. And so they, were, they had this deep sense of awe that God is here and he's working. So key for what we need today in our churches, isn't it? Did you know that in all the uh, missionary advances in the book of Acts, the preaching of the word was accompanied with signs, miracles, and wonders? In every single missionary 
advancement that we read in the book of Acts, there were signs and wonders along with the preaching. It wasn't isolated. Do you think that we need signs and wonders today? I think so too. I'm praying for that. I'm trusting the Lord to do that even in our church and in the church in America and around the world. Why? Well, signs and wonders don't save anyone. Only faith in Christ saves you, okay? But signs and wonders can break down walls of skeptics and doubters and go, whoa, there's something beyond the natural. There's supernatural. I, I'm opening my heart now to this because this, I saw that person they were lame or blind or they couldn't walk and now they can. Something happened. And so it opens up people's hearts to receive the gospel. Our next portion of scripture says, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together in the, at the temple each day, met in homes. It says each day, by the way. Wow. That takes devotion to another level, right? Can you imagine coming to church every day here? That'd be interesting. It's a different culture then, all right? Livelihood, work, all those things. But they met every day, so no wonder things really exploded. They met in their homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals together with great joy and generosity. These, these verses depict the devotion to one another, their unity, their uh, sacrificial love and generosity. It was powerful. Now, today, some people use this scripture as a reason why communism should be implemented everywhere. And that's not true. <laughs> okay, this is not a proof text that communism works, just so you know. All of this generosity, all this giving was voluntary. It wasn't forced. They gave out of their, out of their love and concern for people's needs. Not everyone was forced to give. It was a choice. When a need arose, someone would sell land or possessions to provide money to the apostles, to bring the money to the apostles so the apostles could distribute the help needed for people in need. You follow me on that? It wasn't even communal living. It wasn't like they all shared a compound together. It wasn't that either. They were just so loving and such a solid community that everyone's needs were being met. They would eat together so those who didn't have food or money to pay for food, they were fed at their table. Isn't that attractive, though? Isn't that powerful? We live in a world, we live in a society, though, here in America, where we tend to have more than what we need. But then at this time, they didn't have much. You got to remember this. They were under oppression under the Roman rule. So they were very poor at this time. Okay, so they needed each other. And so they were there for one another and they were devoted to each other in that. Now, Acts 4, 32 to 37 is a great reference for you for this. I'm going to hold off on that because of time's sake. But Barnabas is an example that, that um, Luke is showing later on. Barnabas sold a field and gave it to the apostles to take care of people's needs. And one more point under these verses. Notice that worship flowed out of the temple and into their homes. I think that's important, that we, the church, worship God here, but our worship continues together in our homes. And I know that can be difficult and hard and a struggle because, you know, people like, we like our personal space, we like that um, private time, but people also need us as well. And let me, let me just hold off. I'll hold off. I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. I'm sorry. Let me keep going. Verse 47, because of all this going on, their devotion, all the, all the devotion to one another, to the word, to prayer, to helping each other in need, guess what the Lord did? The Lord added to their fellowship daily those who were being saved. You know what I think happened? I think God was like, this church is going to care for these people, so I'm adding even more salvations to this church. Because they were welcoming people into the body of Christ. They were able to help these people grow. But I also think that this community was contagious in a good way. It was attractive. It brought even more people in because they saw the love for God, the love for one another, the generosity for each other. And people were like, I want that. I see signs and wonders. I see people getting healed. I want whatever they have. 
And so they would tell them about Jesus. Now we can assume here that it wasn't just the Lord adding because of what they were doing for one another. We can also assume that they were being witnesses because remember what, what the word says in Acts 1.8. Jesus says, and you will be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses. So these believers were sharing their faith, sharing the gospel. The apostles were sharing and preaching the word. And then they were also sharing their lives. Do you think that that would bring more people into the kingdom of God? Yeah, you know what? That's actually how many missionaries do it. Many missionaries build a life in a community where the people need Jesus, and they do everything we just read in Acts 2, 42 through 47. It's pretty cool. So let's, let's uh, apply this to our lives, timeless church. No matter how much time goes on, there are things that shouldn't change in a church. Would you agree? And we see in this scripture things that we can apply to our, to our day today. No matter how much time passes, the practices and the ministry of Acts 2 Church can be applied and translated into modern day. The church should always be devoted to, number one, sound biblical teaching and preaching of the word. We need to be devoted to that. New believers need the word of God. The lost need the gospel. We as the church need the word of God more than anything else. We must be dedicated to this, especially in the days that we're living in. Colossians 2, 6 through 7 says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. And the next portion of scripture says that this growth is needed, otherwise we might fall for false teachings. So when, we, when someone gets saved, they need the instruction of the Lord. And I think that's why it's the first thing that we see mentioned by Luke is right away, they didn't leave Jerusalem after they got saved. They stayed and they learned as much as they could before they left, if they weren't living there. So if you have given your life to Christ, but you have not taken time to read and study the Bible, I want to encourage you to do that. And I'm going to uh, share with you how we can help you with that as well moving forward. The church was devoted and still should be devoted today to worship and prayer, number two. Worship and prayer. Worship isn't just singing songs, just, just to make sure we all understand. Worship is how we live outside these walls. Obeying God, doing his will on earth, um, loving others is a way that we worship God. We bring glory to him when we do that. The words we say, the things we think are acts of worship to the Lord. The praises that we give him. The giving, the serving, they're all ways that we worship him. What about when it comes to prayer? I'm going to um, share my heart on this as a pastor. I want you to get a little view inside my head and my heart on this. Because I think prayer really needs to increase in the church. Okay, but not just through organized prayer meetings, but a lifestyle of prayer in the church. And I always wondered, why don't we pray more together when we gather at church on Sundays? Can I be, um, let me just share with you what I feel like God's been telling me, is that we need to take time to pray for one another before we leave. And I don't know why that's awkward. I, I have some feelings that maybe if you don't know how to pray, you're scared to pray, right? That makes sense. You're a little nervous to pray because, you know, you don't want to sound funny. You don't, maybe you don't know how to pray. Maybe you're not a believer, so you don't even know. You never learned. But what if we took time to pray for each other before we left and you learned because a believer was praying for you? And we don't even know what's going on in the lives around us, do we? We have no idea some of the burdens we're carrying when we come in here or things we have to face when we leave. Don't you think a little prayer over each other would help? And what if, if by praying for each other, we got to know each other and form friendships and became the brotherhood and sisterhood of Christ, right? The brothers and sisters of Christ, and together we're the church. Because the church that prays together stays together. And so there's unity as well. Yeah. Do you agree that we should pray when we come together in church? 
Great, because we're going to do that at the end of service. Which I need to hurry up and get there because last service, it took too long. And Okay, I'm glad you, you agree. Fellowship with one another. Do not overlook this. The entire paragraph is that they were together. Okay, they were all finding ways to be together. All right. There was a desire for what's called biblical or spiritual fellowship. Not just cookies and coffee. Hey, where'd you get that shirt? That looks nice. Not the superficial surface stuff. Hey, how can I pray for you? Let me tell you what the word of God taught me this week. Let me share that with you. All right. Let me tell you a testimony what God's doing this week in my life. Well, for them, they met daily. So what happened today? <laughs> like, that, that's the kind of fellowship people need. And here's why. It's one thing for me to teach you. It's another thing for someone in this church to show you. You know, the word encouragement in the Greek is actually two words put together. Now, I'm going to mess up the second word, um, but it's parakalio. And para means to come alongside. So any paraprofessionals in the church? Any paramedics? So you're, that, you, that word comes from the Greek to come alongside someone and help them. And then the second part of the word encouragement has to do with exhort or teach or urge or encourage someone to do something, to teach someone. So do you know that you're not supposed to just verbally say it? You're actually supposed to come alongside someone and show them what you mean? That's what it means to encourage one another in the body of Christ. I personally always needed someone to show me what they meant. My teachers, they couldn't stand me in school. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to need a little extra time after class to show me that algorithm that you just showed me or whatever algebra formula that was because I have no idea. You're going to have to just show me that. So people need that, and that's what fellowship provides. In other words, hey, okay, here's the things you need to do. Now that you gave your life to Christ today, you need to pray, read the Bible, yada, yada, yada. Serve, give. Well, wait a second. How do I do that? Oh, you'll figure it out. You got it. Right there in the Bible. That is not at all what Jesus meant by discipleship and fellowship. Are you following me? The church, the, the reason why the church exploded in Acts 2 and just grew is because people showed them how to be a follower of Christ. And church, let us be like that. I'm not going to tell you when or how. I'm just encourage you to, to become that kind of person have you ever shown anyone how to play a card game or a board game? And then they go and buy the game. And then now everyone buys the game and everyone's playing that game. Okay, or a movie, you know, you tell someone to go watch this movie, everyone watches me. Point is, is we make it more complicated. Help someone learn how to read the Bible and pray by just doing it with them. Okay, that's discipleship. That's biblical fellowship. Let me move forward. Um, oh, I've heard this said too. You are the sum of who you surround yourself with. I also believe, though, more importantly, you are who lives inside of you, and you have Jesus Christ inside of you. And who you surround yourself with in the biblical community really helps you become more and more like Jesus. All right? Okay. Fourth, what we see here is sacrificial love and generosity. We have a large church here. Speaking from my heart again, we have a large church here. And so seven pastors and staff members who also really care, our administrator, administrative assistants, they will take your phone calls and pray for you. We've trained them. We've taught them to do that. But you know that you are our greatest reach and care team of this church. That, man, oh, we are so blessed. When Pastor Cornelius and I get word that you went to a hospital visit for someone you know in this church or a friend or something like that, you know how blessed we are? Because I can't be everywhere at the same time. And so when we work together like this, or when someone has a need and they need help and you step up and do it, you know how amazing that is? That's what they did back then. We need each other to do this. Do you agree with that? Like if, I, I'm, I'm cool with you saying, hey, Ryan, there's someone who needs, you know, here's, here's one of the ones I've gotten. Well, I think they're demon possessed. Do I have to do that one or do you want, do you want to come and do that one for me? <laughs> How do you know they're demon possessed, first of all? And, uh, no. So, yeah, there are some things you might want to call the pastor on, okay? That's all I'm saying. But there are simple, everyday 
moments where I was on the phone with a lady one time here at the church. I called her up. Do you know that she was in such a pit and within 15 minutes she was on the phone praising the Lord? And you know what she said? She said, I'm going to call some people I haven't been calling because I've been in my pit and now I'm going to go call them and see how they're doing. I said, what? Do you hear yourself right now? You were just depressed. You didn't feel like anything was going to change in your marriage and all this stuff. And now you're going to go try to help people. Do you know that 15 minutes of biblical fellowship encouraged her and changed her life? 15 minutes. Yeah. And listen, I didn't know what I was supposed to say. I had no idea. I'm finding out just as much as you are the first time. But the Lord just used me to encourage her. And the Lord gave me things to say. He will do the same thing for you. I feel like we're getting somewhere today. I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, Sacrificial giving and generosity. uh, Quick story, not to pat myself on the back. It actually didn't work out the way I'd hoped. But yesterday I was at Aldi's and uh, we were shopping there and I avoided the really, I love that one aisle with all the tools and stuff in it for like cheap. I avoided that. My wife was happy about that. But sometimes you can find like grill covers. Anyway, let me get to the point. Um, (laughs) So we're there and we're in line and there's this long line and like no one's coming to help. And so like our flesh is like getting frustrated. Like if I was a manager, I would have like two more registers open, you know. What was happening was is uh, someone in in front of us, uh, quite a few in front of us, um, she, her card wasn't working and we didn't realize that. We were so busy complaining and griping how we want to get out of here that we didn't see someone was struggling to pay for their groceries. So finally, another attendant came, and so they took a few people away from our line, and then we're behind, two people behind this lady. And the Lord made me, like, almost filter out all the stressful parts of that and, and look at this lady and see her, her distress. So she pays for her, or she doesn't pay for her stuff because the car wouldn't work, so they had her come to the side and we pay for our stuff. And as my wife's taking care of that, I go up to her and I say, do you mind if I pay for your groceries, all right, so that you can go along your day? And if you want to pay back, you can. But if not, it's okay. I'll give you my cash app, but I'm just here to help. I just want to help you get along your day. I can see you're under distress. And she goes, no, I, I can't do that to you. And there's tons of groceries. I was like, well, there's definitely a lot of groceries in there. There's definitely a lot of groceries in there. But I function like this. If I do God's work, he'll take care of my finances, okay? Yeah. Praise the Lord. And he has every time. Anyway, I try to, I try to press it one more time. Come on, let me, let me just do it, you know. She's like, no, 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 I'm going to be okay. We're, I'm going to figure this out. And I think she was calling someone to figure it out. Long story short, she didn't let me help, and that's okay. We're on our way out to put our groceries in the trunk and uh, husband and wife, um, she appears to be Muslim wearing the garb and everything. She comes up to us and she rolls the window down and goes, we need more people like you guys. We need more people like you guys, thank you. That made my day, she said. And I said, praise God, praise the Lord. I didn't say praise Allah, I said praise God. Because I want her to know. I should have said praise the Lord because that represents Jesus. I didn't think of it at the time. We, we talked about that on the way home. But you have no idea how your generosity, not just here, blesses people, but outside this church blesses people. So step out in faith and watch God work. Uh, just this past week, we had a family in need. Guess what? We're able to take care of their entire issue they have financially because you have given to the church and we, do, we manage our funds properly and we have a system in place that helps us take care of uh, dire or major needs and we're offering financial counseling so that they can overcome this burden and now be able to help other people. That's what we have set up here. That's awesome. Man, thank you so much for your investment in this church because it's helping families in need in our own church as well. Fifth, what we see here is, I'm almost done, faith in God for miraculous works. We, can't, we cannot let that go away. That must be a timeless devotion of the church is we believe that God can do miraculous signs and wonders today because it's true. Let me read to you scripture, John 14, 12 through 14. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done 
and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. What does that mean? I was a youth pastor, right? So you have some teenagers that ask, so can I ask for a million dollars? If I say in Jesus' name, <laughs> I wish. And it comes, you know, shows up at your door. Nah, not exactly. I don't think that's what, I don't think that's what the scripture is saying. To be in my name means in according to the will of God and who Jesus is. Like what matters to Jesus? Who is his nature? In my name means his nature and characteristics. And so just to give uh, uh, an idea on that, like Jesus cares about healing people and salvation more than he cares about an unbeliever getting a million dollars. You see what I'm saying? So there's like priorities in his name. Now for the believer, can God do financial miracles in your life? Absolutely. But he's also gonna call you to responsibility and giving as well in scripture. Like managing your budget, balancing your, your budget, being careful about being frugal and not overspending. And he's gonna call you to give too, not just receive. And he will do financial miracles in your life. All right, so he cares about that. But does Jesus want people to be saved? Does he want signs and wonders to happen? Yes, and he says, you will do even greater things than me. Why? Because the spirit of God, the power of God is with you to go do it. I think we don't even ask because we don't even believe in the first place. So if we start believing, just start asking. You don't have to feel a certain way. Now I will say that in scripture, you'll see where it says Jesus felt this, the power leave him when he prayed or when that woman touched him, right? So you can feel sometimes the healing power over you when you pray for someone, but sometimes you don't, and there's still a miracle because he wants to heal by faith, not by your works. You're not the healer, God's the healer. So go ahead and take that burden off that I gotta, I gotta do it, I gotta do it. No, God does it. We just step out in faith and pray for it, okay? I'm almost done, I, I promise, I promise. I said that three times now, oh my goodness. Making disciples is our last thing. We see that no matter how much time passes, we are called to make disciples. I take a more comprehensive look at evangelism. I look at the Great Commission because a lot of people lived on evangelize, evangelize. I live on making disciples. What is that? It's to go reach the lost, evangelize the lost, teach them to now go evangelize. That's what it means to make disciples teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's what Jesus said. And he says this, if you do that, I will be with you to the very end of the age. So do you know when Jesus is with you? He's with you at all times through his spirit. But do you know he's gonna show up when you're making disciples? He's gonna work powerfully. If we would step out and do that, he is going to help you reach the lost and help you teach. So why don't we stand together? Because I, I said that we're going to pray for one another. Ooh, I forgot a really important note. I just saw it. Ooh, I'm excited. When we do water baptisms next week, we fully immerse people in the water. They're covered, okay? And we bring them back up, don't worry. <laughs> we bring them back up. You know that we're supposed to do that with new believers, with people who believe in Christ? That we're supposed to fully immerse them in the family of God baptize them in the family of God. Church, it's my dream to see us take care of the lost and those who just get saved. It's my dream to see us care way before Pastor Ryan ever meets. You know what we really need is if one day I find out you've been discipling someone for a year and I never got to meet them yet because you've been baptizing them in the family. You've been fully immersing them in the things of God. Everything we just said is your way of doing that. And it's my dream to see you lead someone to Christ and then help them follow Jesus by your own example. And now you together with that person are reaching more people. You know, that, that can happen without me ever being present as a pastor. You get to do that. You don't have to wait for me to do that. Jesus said to do that before I ever did. Jesus said it. He said, go make disciples. When I read this scripture and I zoom out, I see something really simple for us today. Three things. We need God, we need each other, and the world needs the church of Jesus Christ. Not just us, the people, but Jesus as well. 
If you read that scripture again, look at it. They needed God, they needed each other, and the world needed the church of Jesus Christ. Isn't that true? So real, real quick, around this room, okay, this could be awkward if we make it awkward, but we could also just say hi to people and say, here's what I need prayer for, and then we pray briefly. So people around you, just turn around, introduce yourself to them, because we're going to, you guys said we could do this. I, I, it may have been not a consensus, but I heard a lot of yeses. Okay, I know it can be weird, but there's people around you who you never met because we're just so focused on getting in and out. What if we took time to encourage and pray for one another right now? Let's do that. So safely too, appropriate connections as well. You don't have to hold hands if you don't want to. Just share your names. What could you, what could you use prayer for? It's going to get a little loud. It's okay. Go for it. Share your name and what you need prayer for. I love it. So we don't have time for long stories. Just keep it short. Pray for my family. Pray for my friends. Pray for my finances. Keep it nice and short. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Lord, we come to you right now. We ask that you would heal right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask for those healings, those miraculous touches from you, Lord, for the supernatural to take place. God, we pray that you would answer the prayers for provision and protection for the sick, those who are needy, those who need your grace and your help, Lord. We pray for those answered prayers right now for those who are distraught or distressed or depressed, God, you would encourage them right now in Jesus' name through the koinonia fellowship, the biblical fellowship of your spirit, Lord. Lift up our hearts, Lord God, together. Lord, I pray you break down walls of division. Let there be unity in this place, Lord God. Hear our prayers, Lord God, and bring us together, Lord, as the body of Christ. Lord, break down those walls of hostility and division. Let there be unity and love in this place. God, we thank you for the encouragement that we're hearing right now as we pray. We thank you for the words that are being shared. We thank you for the brotherly and sisterly love, Lord God. And we thank you, God, for the connections that can be made through moments of prayer, Lord. Do your work, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for this message. Help us to be the church, not just spiritually, but physically. Help us to apply this message, Lord, as we leave. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.